Hi, everyone, and welcome to another week of psychopharmacology. I'm super excited this week because we have a very special guest. This is Dr. Erin Bonar, and she is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. University of Michigan Addiction Center, and also an adjunct assistant professor in the psychology department at the University of Michigan. Um, the reason why I asked her to speak today is that she is an NKU alum, and so we are super proud of her, and we thought it would be great um, to ask some questions and um, talk a little bit about her career. So let's start with the first one. I'll just jump right in there, but thank you, Erin, for joining us. Um, first of all, can you talk a little bit about your career path? Like you started at NKU. So where did you start at NKU and then what did you do after that? So I, um, I grew up in Alexandria and NKU, you know, was part of my whole life. And I went to NKU um, and I knew I wanted to be a psychology major you know, I liked helping people and people said I gave good advice. And so that seemed like really, you know, um, something that was interesting to me. So I became a psychology major. And I think an important piece of my story there was that I was also part of the honors program. And because of that, I kind of got to take more classes and different classes um, earlier. So I started taking psychology courses, my course major, really in my you know, advanced level courses in my second year. And I got to know all the professors, some of whom are gone, some are still there, um, and really discovered a passion for um, substance use work in Dr. Goddard's class, Drug Policy. That really changed my life. I knew I liked psychology. I knew I wanted to do something with it, but that um, really developed a passion for that topic in me. And it was uh, through her mentorship that I ended up applying to graduate schools and figuring out the path to a clinical psychology PhD. Um, I was able to you know, apply to several programs, ended up um, interviewing at a few and then accepting um, into the PhD program at Bowling Green State University. So um, it was really the time though at NKU, like I worked on research with um, Dr. Thomas, Dr. McDaniel, who I think has since retired, um, Dr. Thomas might be retired too, and yep. Dr. Goddard and Dr. Hogan. So, so many people, and it was because of those opportunities, I really got to learn psychological science and a passion for that specifically was ignited in clinical science. And um, being able to just have a small class size where I could interact with people, get to know them in such a friendly environment that was so supportive, it allowed me to learn, um, I think, in a way that many people don't get the opportunity. And I think that helped ignite, again, that passion for kind of moving on. So you went to Bowling Green University for a PhD. How many years does it take to do a PhD? And then what did you do after that? So most, uh, most of the time it takes about four to five years of coursework for a clinical psych PhD. Uh, by coursework, I also mean practicum placement. So, you know, in your second year, you might start seeing patients under the supervision of a licensed clinical psychologist. And so um, most people again take four to five years. That's also to complete research work, like a thesis and a dissertation. Many programs offer a master's um, as part of the package toward the PhD, and that's what I did. And then um, one of the things I didn't know fully that was required of a clinical psychology PhD until after I accepted the program and moved there was that there's a required year-long internship. Um, <laughs> and that is, you have to do that to finish the degree. And it's really interesting if you know people who've gone to medical school or are doctors, you know that they go through like a residency match program where they apply all over the country and they have to um, get matched. Uh, basically, they can interview and then get matched by a computer algorithm. Psychology does that too for our required internship for the PhD. I didn't have a full understanding of that until that I had to would have to move again and go work somewhere clinically full time um, until after I accepted into the program. So I may have been a great student, but I wasn't fully prepared. And I, um, you know, so the last piece of that was doing my internship and I um, matched at the Ann Arbor VA hospital, uh, which is, you know, just another hour away from Bowling Green. So it wasn't the biggest move I could, could make, but that's where I ended up um, completing my internship. I graduated then in August, 2011. 
And um, I chose to do a uh, research postdoc, so a two-year fellowship. A lot of clinicians need to work for about a year full-time after graduate school to gain hours toward licensure. And there's an exam and you know, there's state-specific exams sometimes and national exams. And I, um, instead of doing just a clinical only postdoc, I did a two-year research fellowship at the University of Michigan um, Addiction Center where I'm at now as faculty. And so I did the uh, postdoc, I gained clinical hours during that, and I really got to do more research and learn how to write grants, which led to my, um, you know, obtaining a tenure track faculty position here at University of Michigan. So now that you're in the University of Michigan, can you talk a little bit about what that job is like, um, how you spend your time, and how's it, how has it changed over time? Well, I would say we're in a unique situation in terms of how I spend my time, because I'm clearly at home and not at work, uh, but I'll talk more generally about what it was like pre-pandemic too. Um, as a faculty member in a, in a medical school that is a large academic medical center, it's very different than the traditional psychology programs that I sort of grew up in. Um, so for example, we're not teaching courses uh, to undergraduates or graduate students. Um, a lot of our teaching work involves mentoring uh, postdoctoral fellows or teaching clinical things like motivational interviewing to uh, residents and medical students. And so a small portion of my time is spent in teaching and mentoring. Um, over the years, I've spent up to 10 to 20% of my time in um, clinical practice at our outpatient addiction treatment service, um, which is sort of an interesting story because um, until I was hired in 2013, there'd never been, been a psychologist in that clinic. Uh, there had only been, there had been social workers, there had been psychiatrists, but we brought in a new discipline. And so I would do outpatient uh, group and individual psychotherapy with our patients with substance use disorders. And then the rest of my time is spent doing research, which is my favorite thing. Um, I'm kind of a nerd like that, but I really love um, identifying a problem and trying to put together a solution and then tell the story of that. And I like doing that in um, writing in terms of trying to get funding by writing a grant and telling a story of why do I need to solve this problem? Why do I need this money to solve this problem? Why, what will that add to society? And then I also really love being able to communicate that in results and papers and in different publications or conference presentations. Um, and I've really, I've stuck with substance use uh, my entire uh, career. I mean, I do little other things here and there that become interesting, but I'm a substance use person uh, through and through. And I've really focused um, my career right now on working on clinical interventions for preventing substance use consequences. Very much take a harm reduction perspective, which started at NKU for sure. I'd never heard of anything like that before. And very, Dr. Goddard really, you know, showed me the way. So. You, you will make Dr. Goddard extremely happy. <laughs> When she sees us. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I will allow the students to see some of your recent publications and, and you do so much different research. You know, um, all these different projects, like you said, they all tie to substance abuse. Um, are there certain projects that you're working on right now that you're sort of very passionate about or, do, um, you know, do you sort of see things that you want to work on? I'll talk more about things that maybe you won't see fully published yet because they're in the pipeline and they're the things I get to do every day. Um, although there's one paper out on social media interventions uh, for oh. risky drinking. And so I have uh, a couple of studies that are using um, Facebook and people are going to say I'm old, right? Like young people don't use Facebook anymore, but actually about 90% do, <laughs> but <laughs> Facebook and we use Snapchat to deliver prevention interventions focused on alcohol and marijuana use. So, you know, identifying people who are engaging in risky behaviors like binge drinking um, or, you know, pretty heavy uh, cannabis use and uh, connecting with them where they're at. So, you know, a lot of people don't want to come to my door to get treatment, especially if they're engaging in risky behavior and don't see themselves as having a substance use disorder. But if we can give them sort of nudges or intervention messages that are, you know, for us rooted in motivational interviewing, if we can give those into something that they're carrying around in their pocket all day and looking at anyway, 
Mm -hmm. um, they might be more receptive and able to kind of get cued at in their in, when they're in situations to engage in harm reduction behaviors or reduce their use um, or use safe strategies like, you know, getting a ride home instead of, you know, driving and things like that. So I'm super excited about our social media work. And then another trial that we have right now is focused on uh, prevention of opioid misuse and opioid use disorder. Okay. And um, this is among emergency department patients who are ages 16 to 30. So it's still that young adult age range. But I wanna highlight the emergency department in particular because it's a place I never thought I'd end up as a clinical psychologist. But it's also a place where people with substance use problems tend to end up, right? Again, they're not always seeking treatment. 90% of people who need treatment don't get it, but they end up in these other clinical settings where we can initiate interventions or do, um, you know, start therapy. And so we're doing some really cool uh, telemedicine work with ED patients um, focused on opioid misuse and also finding out ways to use uh, patient portals to deliver therapy. So, you know, as a therapist, I don't just sit and talk with the person on my couch, like we all know is a myth <laughs> these days, uh, but I, you know, can do therapy in many different forms and patient portals are something that we're all starting to use uh, and could be also leveraged for more than just asking about a medication refill. We could actually be delivering therapies, uh, written therapies that way. So those are some of the things that are going on that I'm super excited about. Wow, that's really interesting. Some really cutting edge things that are changing with new technology. Um, yeah. yeah, really exciting, really exciting projects. Um, I know we, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so you're talking to the NKU undergraduates. Um, advice for them, you know, what do you think, um, you know, now that you've been through the process, you're well into your career, you started at NKU, what, what advice can you give to our students? I think, um, especially psych students, right? Because I'm going to know y'all best. But um, and thinking about um, taking advantage of the amazing mentorship and faculty that you have at your fingertips. You know, if you're curious about research, if you're curious about where to go next in your career, or how could I, you know, what do different psychology careers look like? The best experts on that are the people teaching your courses who are actually very nice and very engaging and warm people who will give that type of advice. And I, I mean, that's one of the, the biggest benefit for me. And the thing I would recommend was talking to the faculty and, and really, you know, I loved that everyone had an open door policy, which I know is like maybe an open Zoom policy in COVID, um, but that was, that's huge. And I think also looking, um, at how, you know, psycho a clinical psychologist or, you know, an experimental psychologist, those, even within that big label, those jobs can look very different and sort of, you know, using um, especially faculty connections and like alumni connections to understand like, you know, what are things that are people doing and how might they apply to you and, or be of interest to you. And I would say that also, if you're interested in advanced degrees, uh, you know, a master's or a PhD, NKU prepared me well for that. And I think that means that um, others can succeed um, as well. And, you know, again, using that mentorship is going to be critical um, and really, and really like, you know, engaging in your classes, getting the most out of everything. It's a super interesting field. So, uh, you know, there's just so much to learn. And if you're curious, um, or if you're interested in something, I'm pretty sure a psychologist has done some research on it. <laughs> we have such a diverse field. So, so I just, I would just say yes to be curious and use mentorship. Well, thank you. You have provided so much insight and we, we just are so fascinated by your career. So I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your insights. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Well, thank